Hello and welcome to this episode of the Offspring Magazine podcast. I'm Yuli and I will be hosting this episode. I'm very excited to introduce this fourth and last part of my black hole series. To send you off on your way through space and time, I recorded a conversation with Nobel laureate Professor Reinhard Genzel. Professor Genzel has spent most of his career proving the existence of a supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way. For his work, he has received numerous prizes, most recently and most importantly, the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2020, together with Andrea Geetz and Roger Penrose. He tells a fascinating story of how, in a decades-long effort, he, together with his colleagues, managed to measure the orbits of stars around the galactic center so precisely that it leaves no doubt that they must be orbiting around a supermassive black hole. Stick around and enjoy this episode. Hello and welcome to this new episode of the Offspring Magazine podcast. I am Yuli and I will be hosting this episode. I am today here at the Max Planck Institute for Extraterrestrial Physics with Prof Professor Reinhard Genzel. Welcome and thank you so much for joining this episode. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's get started. You, you started studying the Galactic Center um, I think after your PhD, when you went to the US for a postdoc, am I correct? Yeah, that's right. I mean, basically, uh, I started uh, my research in astronomy at a, another Max Planck Institute uh, uh, for radio astronomy, which at that time just uh, got started. Astronomy was not all that uh, that popular in Germany. See, it was mostly physics, of course. Uh, uh, my father was a physicist. Uh, solid state physicist and uh, he was also a Max Planck director so I actually knew from him that there was this opportunity of of going to this new institute and then from there on it was pretty automatic to go to the US uh, as a as sort of a, as a big next step actually at that time I should say I I was quite happy to leave Germany and, and mm -hmm. perhaps uh, if it would have turned out differently I would have stayed in the US okay uh, anyhow, so uh, yes, I, 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 when I when I w came to the U.S. at that time, I did continue to do radio astronomy, uh, and in particular a technique which is called very long baseline interferometry, which mm -hmm. basically allows you to take radio telescopes across nowadays the entire globe, uh, uh, basically record the signals, and then uh, uh, construct afterwards after the fact an image out of this, which has, you know, absolutely fantastic resolution. So this is very important for the, the later parts of my work uh, on the Galactic Center. Uh, after two years, I, 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 however, then had the opportunity to join the group of a very famous physicist in, in California, Charles Towns. Towns is, is sort of one of the great heroes of experimental mm -hmm. physics. Uh, he, uh, in his, when he was young, uh, after the war, he uh, was interested in molecules and how molecules would work. And for that, he needed a, a light source. Uh, a light source, but not in the optical, but in, in the, you know, short wavelength radio domain, millimeter and submillimeter, as we call it, far infrared. And uh, there was no such a bright source yeah. and so this is how he came to develop what we now know as the laser and the maser and that got him the Nobel Prize mm -hmm. and so I got that chance I knew about him uh, from my father but also from from the work they were doing I was fascinated by the style of their research in, in Berkeley mm -hmm. so get, getting that opportunity was just absolutely fantastic and there indeed uh, Towns was uh, already uh, at work with his students and postdocs uh, to look for uh, this black hole in the galactic center. So let me perhaps sort of as a background, of course, black holes, is, uh, if you look at it from today's pers perspective, a very fundamental and, mm -hmm. and fascinating subject in many ways, yeah. physics as well as astronomy. Yeah. Okay, 
And so the reason why towns actually got into this and then uh, I followed was basically uh, black holes were, were predicted, of course, by Einstein's general relativity and uh, several solutions were, were, were known mathematically uh, for the field equations, uh, which then have this property that if uh, a mass is concentrated enough that gravity is strong enough, then even light cannot escape mm -hmm. anymore. So that's sort of the very simple way of, 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 of understanding what a black hole is, so to speak. This has, however, a second, uh, uh, you know, con conclusion behind it, which is uh, light cannot escape, but if you and I would go on a rocket and fly into a black hole, and we would then disappear, so to speak, behind what's known as the event horizon, yeah. which is the region where light cannot escape yeah. anymore, then we cannot stop. Yeah. Okay, we cannot stop. We would just inevitably fly to the center. And there, uh, you know, basically, in, in terms of what General Tutti predicts, crash uh, in the very center in uh, an infinite density uh, point, which is the singularity. So that's a prediction which uh, uh, we would like to test because most of us in physics believe this cannot be true. Mm -hmm. uh, there must be a point in size where this uh, prediction by general relativity, which is a classical uh, theory, has to be amended to a quantum theory, which is not does not exist quite yet. Yeah. But anyhow, so this, this is the theory, and um, but the question is whether nature has deemed it uh, <laughs> 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 necessary and and useful to to realize these objects. So that that really. Uh, didn't happen. I mean, general relativity had these solutions, uh, uh, and 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 the mathematicians were working on that. But really, there was no other relation to to real to the real universe. So when did this change? Well, that happened in the nineteen sixties. Two things happened. Um, number one is the uh, the new field of X-ray astronomy, uh, yeah. studying X-rays. Uh, were looking at the skies and were finding uh, binary objects, so two stars, if you like, where one star was visible in the mm -hmm. optical, but the second one not, mm -hmm. but then was visible in X-rays uh, and highly variable and so forth. And how could that be? Well, the, the understanding was, okay, if, if, a, if a star, a massive star, um, has used up most or all of its hydrogen uh, to make fusion and energy, uh, then gravity takes over. And so then it would collapse. Yeah. And in this collapsing state, however, uh, processes happen which make part of the object explode as a supernova, as we mm -hmm. say. And then uh, ashes remain, so to speak, which collapse to a further small region, and that can become a, a black hole. It can also become a neutron star, but it can become a black hole. So that's the first uh, of the discoveries in the 60s. So the second one was a phenomenon uh, we call quasars, where radio astronomers, also looking at the skies for, for the first time in detail, discovered very distant objects um, billions of light years away, which at that time was a sensation. I mean... We, we, you know, the, the billions of light years means the light has taken almost a significant fraction of the of the age of the of the of the universe to get to us, and and so that that was absolutely not seen before, and so because these objects are so far away, it means they are enormously luminous, yet at the same time they're very compact, that you can uh, see from the variability of these sources. So. The theorists then went ahead and, and, and started, you know, thinking about how could you generate, you know, a thousand times as much uh, luminosity as the entire Milky Way with all of that in a region of only, say, a light year across or something mm -hmm. like this. And and so the the paradoxical explanation which came out of this is black holes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So now you would say, wait, 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 yeah. wait, how can that be now? Uh, and the answer is, 
the idea of a black hole and this gravity, which is so strong that light cannot escape, is only true within a finite radius. Yeah. Uh, this this event horizon. Mm -hmm. So the event horizon for if if we if the Earth would be a black hole, that event horizon would be one centimeter in size. Mm -hmm. So compress the entire Earth yeah. to one centimeter, then we, we would be a black hole. In the case of the Sun, that number is three kilometers. Yeah. And if you go up with mass, well, then the, the radius is proportional to the mass. Yeah. And so uh, the region outside this event horizon, however, you can see. Although, uh, because the gravity is so strong also outside, that means that the light which is emitted uh, arrives at our place uh, redshifted. So mm -hmm. it can be very, very much redshifted. And uh, so uh, that's basically the idea. You have gas falling in or stars falling in to an uh, object uh, you would call a black hole. And on the way in, uh, you ga gain energy because of the gravity and so that you can c convert into radiation. And then, of course, at the end of this, this, this journey, uh, the gas would disappear behind the event horizon. But as long as it's not outside of the event horizon, it can radiate. So that was the idea. And but you know ideas or proposals or theories in in physics and in sciences, of course, is always a little of a, an interesting possibility yeah. uh, in order to prove it. That's really how how we. Uh, so you need to find a way to prove that there's an object there that you would actually call a black hole. And and the idea is basically use gravity again. Yeah. So think of the solar system. Um, so we have the sun dominating the mass in the solar system. And then you have the planets. And the planets move on orbits, as we know from Kepler, um, you know, quasi-circles or ellipses around the sun. And if you measure there the orbital velocities as a function of distance uh, for the different planets, then you go further out, then the velocities go down. Mm -hmm in a very characteristic way, Kepler's laws. Yeah. Okay, so the further you're out, uh, the slower the velocity. And so you turn that around, and in your minds, suppose you switch off the sun, uh, the light of the sun, yeah. that is, mm, but keep the mass. Yeah. So in that system, the planets would more or less move around the same yes. orbits they are in our system, but you can't see the sun. So how do you know that there's a sun? Well, you would go ahead and, and measure the, the motions of the planets, mm -hmm. and, and you would have to conclude there's an object in the center which dominates the mass, yeah. uh, and, and it has one solar mass. So that's the same, that's the idea how you would uh, uh, test that. Uh, but the problem is for these quasars, which I mentioned, uh, they are so far away mm -hmm. that at least at that time it was not practical to yeah. make a measurement of sort of the environment of of the central region and, yeah. and seeing things move. And so, so uh, there was a very imp important uh, publication in 1971 by two British theorists who said, well, uh, these quasars obviously are very rare objects, okay? Uh, and that is because they, uh, they have such high rates of accretion, mm -hmm. and maybe that occurs only rarely. That's what we also actually know now. Yeah. So perhaps then, um, if, if these are rare because they're distant, they're rare, um, there are others which also have black holes, but they don't have such high accretion. Mm -hmm. um, indeed, we know that is the case. We know nowadays that essentially every galaxy, every Milky Way, uh, has a central uh, black hole, and the relationship between the black hole in the center and that of the galaxy is a very, uh, you know, uh, linear almost one. In that, the bigger the galaxy, the bigger the black hole. Yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, if that is the case, well, maybe maybe also nearby galaxies yeah. uh, have black holes, and if it's a nearby galaxy, the nearest is our own. Yeah. So that's 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 where the galactic galactic center comes in. So when when when, when Towns and then I and so forth started looking at the galactic center. We don't do this necessarily to prove something about the Milky Way, but we're using the Milky Way center as the nearest laboratory, if mm -hmm. you like, to test the idea as such. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So before that, was the was the galactic center of major interest to astronomers, or were you the first ones? 
No, okay, well, sure, of course, uh, but it's not easy, actually, turns out. Why? Well, you know, this object is 27,000 light years away. So we are in the outskirts of the Milky Way, in the outer parts. So when we look towards the center, what do we see in the optical? Nothing. Mm -hmm. Okay, <laughs> that's the problem. Why don't we see anything? Well, because uh, we are, the Milky Way is a sort of a disk galaxy, a spiral galaxy, as we say, right? And so there are the stars, uh, a thousand billion stars. Uh, and and between the stars, however, there is a very, uh, you know, a, a certain amount of material, small amount of material, in form of gas and, and dust. And the dust uh, absorbs visible light and ultraviolet light. So it turns out there is enough dust in this interstellar material between us and the galactic center that none of the light which is emitted in the galactic center reaches us. So... You have to then uh, go to wavelengths where the, wa the, the waves can pass through mm -hmm. the dust, and that's longer wavelengths. So radio waves would do that. Um, but radio waves are not a very good way to look at stars, which is or gas, which is what, what we uh, wanted to do. So the uh, next best thing is uh, the so-called near-infrared, mid-infrared, okay. where you can observe from the ground and you can look into the galactic center. Yeah. And that's what Towns did, and Towns uh, had the experimental uh, capabilities from his laboratory work um, to do what we call spectroscopy. So you basically, you, you look at uh, molecular transitions and atomic uh, transitions of ionized and, and cold gas in the galactic center, and then you can use this uh, spectroscopy to see the Doppler motions uh, mm -hmm. towards us and away from us. Uh, so the, the spectral lines are shifted mm -hmm. depending on, on the degree of motion. And so that is one way, at least along the line of sight, to measure the, the velocities. And so then you can do this Kepler experiment, if you like. And, and, and Towns had started that in the mid-70s, so before I actually joined. But then uh, our apparatus was getting better all the time, and we get ever more information, so that by mid-80s, we, uh, we were ready to tell everyone, look, uh, these motions are very large, unusually large for... If, if, if there would only be stars and, and everything else. So uh, we postulated that there was a, a few million solar masses in form of a black hole somewhere in the center. Mm -hmm. Better we couldn't tell. And uh, honestly, nobody believed us at the time. <laughs> that is the fate of, yeah. of, of uh, <laughs> new things. Uh, Why didn't they believe you? Well, the answer is not, uh, twofold. One, one is... Um, the the technique we were using uh, uses gas, and gas is very thinly distributed material, and that you can affect uh, and push around with forces other than gravity. Okay. Yeah. So, for instance, magnetic fields. Yeah. If they are there, uh, the, the especially the ionized gas sees the magnetic fields and is basically you know s sticking to the field lines, and so that would, you know, change the motion compared to only uh, gravity. And the other one is that the motions we were seeing, these gas cloud motions, uh, in, in terms of a million so, a few million solar mass black hole, were way out there uh, in, in terms of distance. So, you know, about a million times the event horizon. So most people said, okay, well, it's interesting that you see these large gas motions, but uh, how do you know this has to be a black hole? Mm -hmm. It's so far Could, away. Yeah, it's so far away, and you're not mm -hmm. sure. So, so th th this was the beginning of a journey, which, you know, turns out lasted then another 35 years, because we had to always uh, go a next step in, in resolution, get better resolution, use new techniques, um, use bigger telescopes, but then you run into the problems with the atmosphere. The atmosphere distorts mm -hmm. uh, the images. Uh, yeah. And, of course, you could say, why don't, go, why don't you go in space? Well, 
uh, the, the biggest telescope at that time was the Hubble Space Telescope. Yeah. And that's not a very big telescope. And so we, we knew, okay, we want to measure in the near infrared. We want to measure not gas, but stars, because stars are a better way of, of seeing uh, uh, gravity motions. And we want to have much higher, higher resolution, angular resolution. So we want to have uh, big telescopes. Well, the big telescopes at that time were four meter class telescopes, but then, uh, you know, a few years later came 10 meter class telescopes. Yeah. Okay, so that's sort of the, the regime. And nowadays, nowadays, what we do is we do the same what the radio astronomers when I was young. Yeah. Uh, did we use interferometry? That is, we we take the four eight meter telescopes of the so called VLT, the very large telescopes of the European yeah. Southern Observatory in Chile, best site in the world, and we connect, so to speak, through uh, uh, light uh, paths, the light from the different telescopes, and thereby we basically we 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 then have the resolution of a hundred meter telescope yeah. uh, through this, and so. But this takes time. Yeah. Takes time and 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 effort. And you you know you're always improving the technology. And so that that is why it took you know in my case uh, a long <laughs> long time until we had really the case so well presented. And uh, a second group also in California then did the same. Andre, I guess uh, that people first of all they could see what what we got we yeah. and they yeah that was a, a very good test if you get different answers well then maybe what one yeah. con- group concludes is not the right one no we got similar answer and then uh, ever better in in terms of uh, resolution yeah. so that's that's how this all happened okay so let's maybe go back to into a bit more detail so um You mentioned your, the first measurements and you were observing gas clouds um, via this, this spectroscopy and Doppler shifts of the gas clouds. And people weren't believing you because basically there were other reasons why these gas clouds could be moving the way they move. And also you were too far away. So then the next step was like, okay, we have to move closer to convince people. And we move to other objects and gas clouds because... People won't believe us if it's gas. That's so right. that's why you then said, okay, then we have to find stars, stars. Yes. to to do this. Um, okay. But so did you already before the, the times of, of interferometry and, and the very large telescopes that you tried, was it possible to find stars already? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think the, the first, I should say, if you go through this uh, uh, in time, the first. Uh, Difficulty at the time was, remember, we are not in the optical, we are in the so-called near-infrared. You have to have sensors, yeah. detectors. Mm-hmm. And if you want to do this efficiently, you want to actually, now in terms of the stars, what you're looking for is the motion, uh, easiest way to do this, is to look at the motion on the sky. Mm-hmm. We call that proper motion, okay? Mm-hmm. So you're not looking at, uh, you can, but we were not in, in only looking for the, the radial motion in spectroscopy, but then actually we were making images and looked how the stars were changing their position from year to year, basically. So the first uh, real hurdle was uh, we needed an imaging detector. Mm-hmm. So in an optical, that was known and at that time in fact the ccd came in but in the infrared no there was no device uh, and that was a bit of a struggle initially and is a struggle up to now really Uh, um, what helped us i have to say was the fact that the military in the u.s uh, uh, needed the same technology to look at russian rockets Okay. Okay. Yeah. And so they, in fact, had the money to make developments of uh, semiconductor devices, which would allow you to m- create images. And over time, this then, uh, you know, filtered through to the mm-hmm. to the civilian sector, and mm-hmm. later on, also, actually, we, nowadays we build our own detectors, so yeah. it's not anymore that we depend on anyone. Uh, but that was the, really the the, 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 the the big step, and in particular here in Germany, because at that time I had then moved from California to, to, to Germany, and uh, to get a detector which is classified 
a lot of years yeah. into Germany, and <laughs> that's not so easy. But anyhow, that was sort of the beginning issue. The next issue, um, we only had a three and a half meter telescope available at that time, on a good site in Chile, uh, but but only three and a half. So that's a pretty good resolution. But uh, of course, it would have been nice to have better resolution. So uh, the progression was go go ahead and start. Uh, then come the issue of the Earth atmosphere. So, uh, if you recall, if you if you if you are in a, a very hot on a hot street, then the the air is flimmering, right? Yeah. And it's this effect which uh, basically distorts the waves, and uh, you cannot get to what we call the diffraction limit. What is that? The diffraction limit is is a physical limitation uh, which is given by the ratio of the t diameter of the telescope and the wavelength. Mm -hmm. So the bigger that ratio, the higher the angular resolution. But uh, as soon as you have the Earth atmosphere interfering, so to speak, yeah. then you can't get to that limit. Mm -hmm. So we had to learn how to, how to fool the Earth atmosphere. Initially, we did that by making very rapid images so that the Earth atmosphere doesn't have time to distort the uh, distort the images. So you record all these short exposures, and then afterwards on the computer you move the images around. Not very efficient way of doing it, but that was how we started. Uh, and then the next big step was what we call adaptive optics. So you actually measure the distortions okay. directly in the instrument because uh, you can take the light from a nearby star and uh, basically you the star would be uh, you, you know it's a point source basically but you know but when you record it you can see the distortions and then you have what we call a deformable mirror in the train in the path to the detector and you basically use that uh, deformable mirror and a com very fast computer to been unbend what the earth atmosphere has done so it's like so a live correction it's a live correction and that is what all big telescopes do nowadays as in fact as another step which is if you don't have a very bright star near the object you're looking at uh, then nowadays we make our own star so we actually send a laser up into mm -hmm. the upper atmosphere and and generate so to speak a bright spot uh, very close to the uh, source so you know all these techniques had to be you know brought in and then yeah. Uh, you know, develop them to a degree which then could be used. And so in this process, then we initially we were saw the first motions of these stars, as I said. They gave us the same result, by the way, as the, mm -hmm. the gas clouds. Um, but again, we were not so close to the center, the, this argument, mm -hmm. uh, could, it, could it not be something else other than a black hole, still, still was valid. And, and so the next step, well, there you need uh, still bigger telescopes. That was then the transition to 8 and 10 meter class telescopes, which we have. Uh, but that still is not enough. It's only a factor of a few in terms of resolution. Uh, yet, I told you, initially we were a million times away from the event horizon. So now we are maybe 100,000 times away mm -hmm. from the event horizon. Yeah. That's still not enough to convince everyone very clearly. Yeah. People were impressed, but... but and. Um, so what do you do? Well, you, you have to be lucky. I mean, in this case, you this is the limitation of doing physics experiments in, in the universe. You can't change the experiment, so to speak. Yeah. <laughs> you have to count on nature. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and nature was very, very generous. Uh, they gave us stars. Uh, uh, nature gave us stars in the galactic center, which come as close as about a thousand times the event horizon. Okay. And that was not expected. In fact, I mean, it, it would have been very clear to everyone if you would have told people, okay, we want to make measure, make that measurement. They would have said, no, no, no it, can't, it can't possibly be. Mm -hmm. But we went ahead and, and we were lucky. Nature gave us stars. And the trick there is these stars are in extremely elliptical orbits. So, you know, they are away most of the time, but then sometimes they come very close. Okay. And one of these stars, both Andrea and we then saw, so go through this very closest approach uh, in 2002. A highly elliptical orbit, moving then at, you know, two and a half percent the speed of light. So that's uh, about, a, you know, several hundred 
to a thousand times the velocity of the Earth around the Sun. Mm -hmm. And then, in fact, the evidence was so good uh, already then uh, because you could yeah. see this very fast motion and now you're a thousand times away. Yeah. Then the probability that there are other options uh, you know, was getting dwi dwindling to, <laughs> okay. to a, not not zero, but yeah. to very unlikely. And so, by two thousand two, I would say most of the astronomy community was accepting. Aha, uh -huh, that's okay. probably the best evidence we now have for these okay. black black holes to exist. Uh, but uh, there are still a number of buts here. No, number one is still a thousand times away. Uh, and next one is. Um, uh, basically, you have to use general relativity to interpret the results, including also excluding alternative options. And so how do you know that general relativity actually holds in this regime? Mm -hmm. general, relativity, general relativity has been tested you know, numerous times, but in what we would call low curvature of space-time. Right. So in the laboratory on Earth or in the solar system, this is a totally different regime there around a black hole. And so uh, by 2003 or four, it was clear if we wanted to do better, then we had to uh, look, for, observe this star and not only the motion, but actually the entire orbit and see it when it comes around the next time. We knew that it would happen 16 years later to, in 2018. Mm -hmm. And then have equipment which could see the effects of general relativity, and that was sort of, uh, you know, a big, uh, big challenge. And the, that that then involved interferometry, okay. uh, so to bring together the four uh, eight meter telescopes in uh, on on Paranal and being ready on time, etc. Okay. It's a very challenging development, yeah. and but we were ready, and mm -hmm. and so by 2018, and now, I mean. Tonight we are observing, okay, yeah. <laughs> with this, <laughs> uh, and uh, the the amount of uh, what we've learned in the last few years, also Andrea, but I mean, the interferometry is really unique now, uh, is fantastic. So we can actually see the, the in detail effects of general relativity. Indeed, they are just what general relativity predicts. We can say something about what other than a black hole there might be. I mean, there could be two black holes. There could be a, a big black hole and many, many other smaller mm -hmm. black holes. And it appears that this is a pretty lonely big black hole, okay? okay. And uh, the next thing is we can not only see this, these stars at, at a thousand times the event horizon, we see also uh, the environment of the uh, uh, event horizon glowing in infrared light, so once every day. And it turns out this is probably when there is... Uh, you know, a lot of acceleration of hot material, hot gases, which start then to produce so-called synchrotron radiation and produce sort of a hot spot for a little while, about a few hours. And that moves. Okay. And we can see this motion on, on uh, just a few times the event horizon size. And that takes, uh, you know, say 50 minutes or so to go around and moves at about a third speed of light. Okay, so that's pretty impressive. That is impressive, That's yes. pretty <laughs> impressive. And at the same time, also the radio astronomers now have yeah. been looking at this, pretty much the same region, and there they're using the fact that uh, general relativity, of course, predicts that light is affected by, yeah. by, by gravity. I mean, the fact that there's a black hole is yeah. exactly that. But you can shine, so to speak, light from the backside at us, and 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 then you know, obviously, if if it were not general relativity but normal uh, physics, you would certainly expect the event horizon to be black. Yeah. Okay, because everything would fall into the black hole. But in general relativity, actually, prediction is that the region where photons fall in is bigger than the event horizon due to the bending of light. Mm -hmm. And so that has now been measured and. Yeah. Uh, it's exactly how you would expect it for the mass which we've uh, yeah. measured. So I would say by excluding ever more the possibilities, we are now in the in the regime where we uh, where we can say, yeah, yeah, that looks like a black hole. Is a black hole. However, one has to be careful. I mean, <laughs> physics never ends. You yeah. know, I yeah. told you at the very beginning that 
there are things which general relativity predicts, which most of the phys physics community would say we don't don't think that this is the uh, ultimate answer. Mm -hmm. the, the central singularity is one of them. Yeah. The other one is uh, if you take a black hole and you grow its mass, say by throwing rocks in, okay? And suppose you have a second black hole of the same mass, but that one you've grown by, by throwing refrigerators in. Then general relativity would say well, there's no difference because you only need uh, three quantities, or rather, let's say two, to describe a black hole. Its mass, and then how fast it spins. Mm -hmm. Nothing else is needed. No other information is needed, nor available. Yeah. Okay, it's all hidden in the event horizon, and, and you can't get there. So, if from the point of view of general relativity, these objects are extremely simple, and yet at the same time, from a point of view of us, we cannot tell the, the the rock black hole from the refrigerator black hole, and there are uh, very general considerations uh, in quantum theory say that can't be, because there are conservation of quantum numbers which we know happen in the quantum world, which would have to apply to a black hole as well if we had a proper theory of of quantum mm -hmm. gravity, which we don't, as I said, yeah. but 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 these very general considerations then tell us uh, there must be a difference between a rock black hole and a and a, and a refrigerator <laughs> black hole, so to speak. Uh -huh. uh, and so they, 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 these questions will will continue. And I, I, this is, I, there are some people who say that black holes, in terms of physics, are sort of the the atoms of the twenty first century in terms of. Uh, what we still don't know about them, mm -hmm. okay? Yeah. So we, we we now, with some certainty, know they exist. Also, I, I, I mentioned in the very beginning the so-called stellar black holes, which yeah. the X-ray community saw that we can uh, look at with, with great detail now with gravitational waves, yeah. which can be seen when two uh, stellar black holes or orbit each other and then lose energy because they radiate Gravitational waves, in the end, they spiral inwards, yeah. and then they m m merge towards a single yeah. uh, uh, black hole. So that, that has been seen. Uh, but many of the other properties uh, we have not yet tested. And so that will keep, even after I'm looking at the daisies from below, uh, <laughs> I'm sure that will keep physicists uh, busy. Now, there is another final aspect to all of this, which is the astronomy universe part, you know, what are they good for, these black holes? Yeah. Do they have any role or what? Or yeah. they just sort of sit, sitting there as schmarotzers in the centers? Yeah. And the answer, oh yeah, they have a very important uh, role to play in the evolution of their host galaxy. Mm -hmm. So they both, uh, we now know, uh, formed very early in the universe, uh, and then they grew together. Um, and in the end, it can be that the uh, the central black hole, if it uh, accretes a lot, starts actually uh, spewing out enough energy and winds and, and all of that into the galaxy to, so to speak, uh, kill the galaxy. Mm -hmm. Okay, by removing uh, interstellar material, and the interstellar material is the food for forming new stars, so it can eject this interstellar material, and all of a sudden, a galaxy makes a transition from uh, sort of a, a galaxy like our own spiral galaxy with m lots of gas and star formation into a, what we call an elliptical galaxy, which is basically dead. I mean, yeah. there's still stars there, old remnant stars, but not much new star formation. Yeah. Yeah. So we now know that this is a sort of a, this symbiosis between the black holes and, and the and the galaxies we, which they're in is a, is a very important part of the evolution of the universe. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's really interesting. I mean, and what you were saying that, yeah, there's so much that we might not yet know about the black holes and the, the atoms of the 21st century. If, if It makes sense if you think about the fact that, well, we only saw them for the first time, as you said, in, in X-rays in the, in the 70s, 60s. It's not that old. I mean, there are other parts in physics where people have been looking or like searching for things or discovering things for maybe even centuries when you look at astronomy. And yeah, we've only been doing this for a few decades. So um, 
it's yeah it makes you excited for for what else we can learn i guess yeah um i wanted to ask you more about because you mentioned that you had these 16 years time between 2002 where you had these images that what you were still doing with adaptive optics at mm -hmm. the time mm -hmm. where you where the point that was the point where people were actually started believing kind of that that is really a black hole there and then you had these 16 years of getting interferometry working to to actually capture the the general relativistic relativistic effects um so how like what had to go into that or like um how is infrared interferometry working is it different from radio interferometry how yeah. what technology did, uh, did you develop? so so what is the principle of this interferometry basically what um what you do in any telescope, right, is you have waves coming in, light waves or radio waves, doesn't make, make any difference. Uh, and the telescope is, is such that you basically have a shape of, the, of this telescope, parabolic shape, which then, which then focuses the light to a point. Mm -hmm. And there you have a detector and you make an image. That's the, the picture of a telescope. Now... You can replace, in thought, uh, this uh, continuous structure here by only a few points. Mm -hmm. yeah. And again, do the same. You bring the light together and focus it. You can, again, focus it and get an image. It's not as good an image as, as you know, a, a full telescope would be. So interferometry to first order is just as doing the same. You do interference of light in a, in a, in a common focus. Um, uh, and then you basically, uh, in, in, in this process, then form, form an image. Um, you can, however, go one step further. You can uh, take these points, which, which, which I had, say four, and you record actually here and here and here, um, not the intensity, what you're seeing here, but the electromagnetic field strength and the so-called phase. Mm -hmm. And if you have that, so to speak, recorded in your detector, then you can go away and then make this interference, which we did so far, uh, directly in the path afterwards. Okay, yeah. One by one. So this is the, the very long baseline idea. You don't have to do the detection, as we say, uh, right away. You can also do it later on, as long as you can store the information. Mm -hmm. But in... Optical, uh, in optical wavelengths or in infrared wavelengths, you have real additional difficulties. First, your much, much shorter wavelength. Okay, so the accuracy of determining phases and making this interference is, you know, about a million times uh, more difficult than in the classical radio, radio regime. The next uh, the, the changes in atmospheric uh, conditions is much faster also because now you are at shorter wavelength and so everything is, is much faster. So in the radio regime, you, you have minutes or even hours before things change due to the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. In the optical near infrared, it takes a millisecond. Mm -hmm. So when you do any experiment, you have to be, uh, you know, you have to be very, very fast. And fast means, of course, the detectors have to be very fast. Then they shouldn't be noisy and, and, and so forth. So there are a number of challenges. The next one is um, this interference uh, we, we, we were using here has to, of course, relate to an accuracy. This thing really has to be a parabolic, okay, uh, with a very great accuracy so that all the rays come together uh, uh, exactly as they should. Mm -hmm. So if you now think of your four telescopes which you're using instead of this, this, then you have to basically add these rays from the different the, the waves from these different points very accurately. And mm -hmm. again, that's a, a, a small fraction of the wavelength. In the radio, that's not so difficult. Yeah. But in the in the optical, so you see, I mean, it basically, in principle, it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. But then, in practice, uh, you know, it's, it's yeah. If you if you if you think about all the factors involved, it's a very large factor more difficult in the in the optical regime. But then, technology has moved on. I mean, uh, 
uh, optical interferometry uh, was in fact t tried a hundred years ago by uh, Michelson, a very famous uh, physicist. Mm -hmm. uh, and so he, what he did was uh, he would take a, an optical telescope and put little, uh, you know, periscopes uh, on top and take exactly like, like I said here and br bring the light together from these outrigger uh, periscopes in the, in the big telescope. And with that, he could actually resolve stars, but only very, very bright stars. Okay, and so it took, yeah, I could, you can say it took 100 years, but of that 100 years, really, the last, say, 20 years uh, of technology to do exactly that, but now to a degree where it's extremely accurate and also the sensitivity is good enough that we can do this in the, in the galactic center. And this... Uh, this uh, machine which we built for the VLT called Gravity is really world unique at this mm -hmm. point. I'm sure there will be others in the future, but uh, uh, it's it's really a, a big a big step. And when we started it, it, most people would say you can't do that. I mean, yeah. it's just not possible. But uh, my uh, co-worker and colleague uh, Frank Eisenhower, who le led that experiment, is really a genius. And so we had a very, very good team, and so we actually ma managed to put it together. And as I said, on time, so that yeah, that's, the star is coming. Yeah, <laughs> that's the thing. Later doesn't wait. And like, yeah. if you had would have missed that, you would have had to wait another sixteen yes, years. Yes, yes, so yes. Uh, that's really an incredible achievement that you you managed to do that. Yeah, very impressive. Well, I should say, of course, perhaps we can put it in perspective. Um, many of the things we did, first of all, of course, uh, I owe, we owe to the fact that uh, we have a fantastic team of young people. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, you can't do that by yourself. Yeah. It's very <laughs> clear. Uh, so it's not my Nobel Prize. It's It's... A prize for the entire team, and the second uh, thing, of course, is how big is the team? Sorry to ask. Uh, well, it's a European team. Uh, this 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 uh, interferometer team is about mm, fifty people now. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Here in at our institutes, maybe twenty, fifteen, twenty people. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so it's it's getting there. I mean, mm -hmm. these are these are not cheap experiments yeah. anymore, uh, which is of course a bit of a concern if you want to still do better in the future. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the other thing is the Max Planck Society. I mean, I think, uh, I, as I said, I enjoyed extremely uh, the, the possibilities and the excitement in the U.S. Mm. But although I was doing very well there in the, in the mid-'80s and would have stayed in Berkeley, I... When I got the offer from Max Planck, I knew uh, that this would be uh, the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. Although the blue skies in, in California yeah. and the rest <laughs> of it are very attractive, I knew that this would be why. It's because uh, in, the, in the US, and in fact in the German university system, let's be clear about it, anything you would like to do, of course, you have to write a, a proposal. Yeah. That's okay. I mean, if you're convincing, yeah. But the so-called peer reviewers, in uh, who look at the proposal and judge whether you should be getting money or not, of course, are people who are critical and conservative. Yeah. When conservative means, let's look at our star again. Uh, if I would have written, uh, you know, and and then we want to observe stars, which uh, come. Uh, as close as the thousand Schwarzschild radii, uh, conventional wi wisdom at that time it would have said no, yeah. they they don't exist. Yeah. And in fact, I can. This is not just an assumption I'm making. Andrea Guess yeah. uh, initially crashed in the U.S. Mm -hmm. exactly because of that reason. Her first proposal to do what we already were doing. We were a little ahead, but we didn't have yet uh, first results. Uh, um, Andrea pr proposed a uh, funding proposal to do exactly that, and uh, the, the reviewer said, no, you can't do that. 
then later on, she she got funding to to do it anyhow, and we had of course already uh, gotten the results. But that's that's where Max Planck is unique. That you sort of speak as a director here or group leader, uh, you get the opportunity of t doing very high risk. Uh, projects mm -hmm. over a pretty long period of time yeah. also uh, yeah. uh, as long as you you know you can show that you're making progress I mean it's not that we we, we are trusted for everything but yeah. you know the, yes there is control in the system but still it's 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 possible to do risky things mm -hmm. and that then can pay off yeah I'm not saying it always pays <laughs> off but it, it can pay yeah off. that's that's the thing with the high risk projects yeah and some of them might not pay off but if they do it's um, yeah it's a novel price <laughs> um, the, the measurement that you have done of the mass of the of the black hole at the center it is an extremely precise measurement right mm -hmm. Is it is it the most precise measurement that we have of any black hole or? Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. by far. Yeah. I mean the, the you know when you talk about precision, you have to be um, very careful. So there is one thing which we call the statistical precision, and there is a second you would have to call uh, the accuracy of the measurement, including all other possible sources of uncertainty including systematics mm -hmm. uh, so in measurement in experimental ethics you have to always distinguish between the two so in terms of statistical uh, how well can we so to speak measure uh, that's now better than 0.1 percent so it's about uh, uh, 8 by 10 minus 4 that's by far the most but if she ask well you know have you have you really understood all the sources of systematics? Then the systematic uncertainty is, um, I would say, three four times worse. So, but that still is, I don't know, point three percent or something like mm -hmm. this. Yeah. So, for astronomy standards, that's pretty damn good. I mean, as in astronomy, it used to be that the the, the physics community. Uh, remember, my father was a physicist. They would also say, ah, yeah, the astronomers, my God, I mean, an order of magnitude is what they do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's not the case anymore in some, some regimes. I mean, the, the most well-known is, of course, cosmology and the expansion of the universe yeah. and so forth. That's where precision measurements are possible by, you know, basically using many, 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 many uh, objects uh, in order to mm -hmm. get the statistical accuracy. And uh, the Galactic Center is now a, a second case where you can really measure things extremely well. Um, and, you know, you better you can do this, then in the end you can uh, drive up the, the, the detail you will get in, in terms of the, the, the physics behind it. Yeah, awesome. Um, and another question I thought of you, because we're always talking about these the stars and that they people weren't even expecting them to be there but why exactly why weren't they thinking that they could very be? good question okay the answer is the following i mean uh, suppose you put a black hole into a galactic nucleus because it's like the sun and the planets uh, what you get is an energy ex interaction through gravity and energy exchanges in the system and in this energy exchange, basically, uh, you create objects which lose energy, and therefore they move inward. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you have, you know, stars of different masses uh, and also stellar black holes, uh, then you would expect the most massive of the stars to move the most uh, efficiently inward. Mm -hmm. So after a while. You would expect there's the black hole, then the most massive systems, uh, say, well, are stellar black holes. So there, there is a sort of a concentration of stellar black holes. But stellar black holes are rare, really. I mean, there are very, very few stellar black holes. Then neutron stars should also be there because they are, you know, moderately massive, actually. Uh, more massive stars might also move inward, but uh, it takes too long relative to their lifetime. 
Mm-hmm. Okay. Otherwise, you would expect them to, you know, be the closest. And uh, nature has found a way uh, to trick these time scales. Um, if you have a situation uh, of a binary uh, object and and the big black hole, where the binary by chance is initially on an almost parabolic orbit, so. If if you so to speak go out out very distant from the black black hole and you have a, a process, what we call scattering, uh, which brings the binary on essentially uh, 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 randomly to, on an orbit which is almost directly pointed at the center, then it flies inward, and that could now be two fairly massive and young stars. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the, the reason they move inward is just directly, uh, you know, aimed aimed at the galactic center. And now happens uh, as you go inward, the velocity of the binary is getting bigger and bigger. Of course, right? Uh, and at some point, the velocity of the binary is far in excess of the binding energy of these two stars. Okay. If they were out there. Okay. So then you get a three-body interaction between the big black hole and this uh, this binary, where a little bit of energy is transferred from that binary to that one. Then this turns out that binary, that member of the binary, uh, is not bound anymore, mm-hmm. and this one is is strongly bound. So it disrupts the binary instantaneously in here. This one is get shot out, and that one gets stuck. Now very far in. Ah, okay. So that's a that's a process which you know you wouldn't necessarily think about, no. <laughs> but that's that's likely the the process which which generates these very strongly bound, uh, highly elliptical orbit uh, okay, yeah. stars we're looking at. They're young, they're massive, uh, and in, the, in addition, uh, they were p- probably part of a binary. And the other p- binary, of course, I said is shot out. Now, how fast? Well, the velocity is thousands of kilometers per second, and so then the, the, this 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 hype, what one calls a hypervelocity star, is moving out of the galactic center, out of the Milky Way, and is leaving the galaxy. And these stars are seen. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, one has seen uh, maybe fifty such stars, and, and and for a few, you can actually measure well enough their orbits that you can say they come. From, from the galactic center, yeah. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Okay. Fascinating. <laughs> so the the only other way to do this is you form stars. I mean, the stars, as I said, the stars we are looking at are fairly bright, very massive, say 5 to 15 solar masses, sometimes even more massive, and uh, young. And... This the trick of of beating the sort of speed at which they can sink in otherwise through energy exchange is sort of the the, the first uh, way to do this. Another way of doing this is you bring in gas. Mm-hmm. Uh, you bring in gas and then uh, you let the gas fall into the galactic center, uh, and then at some point it will shock, get very high temperature, and then cool again, and then you might form stars. Locally, yeah, and that actually is is a process which happens in the galactic center, mm-hmm. but not in this innermost region, okay. because there the density of the gas, in order to be self gravitating and overcoming the, mm-hmm. the the tidal forces from the black holes, is just t- too much. Mm-hmm. But a little further out there, in fact, are a few, a few million years ago, uh, uh, about two hundred stars formed. And we see these stars. Okay, okay they end sort of a disk-like configuration. Yeah. Are these stars, when they move at this very fast velocity close to the black hole, are they deformed in any way? Very good question. <laughs> <laughs> you know the details. <laughs> yep, and that's one way of destroying uh, stars uh, is tidal disruption. Uh-huh. So if a star goes by chance, say, close enough that the force from the black hole to the front part of the star uh, and the back side of the star is sufficiently different that it cannot be held together by uh, internal gravity of the star, then you can imagine the thing, you know, 
specifies, and then uh, uh, part of the star, about half of the mass of the star, falls in, and the other half of the star uh, is, is ba uh, ejected back out. In fact, uh, we've seen such an object, uh, although it was probably not a star, but a uh, perhaps the outer parts of a star, so sort of the the ionized gas around mm -hmm. around the star, or only a dense gas cloud. We don't know the details, but what we've seen is indeed one one such object to come into the galactic center, pretty much the same distance, but then start to to uh, specify mm -hmm. and uh, and the expectation, in fact, was that it's disrupted and then falls in. But it didn't do that, actually. But it's coming back out, and it's beginning to re, recollect itself, so to speak. Yeah. Okay. We talked a bit about, um, yeah, these. I'm yeah, I'm more curious about these aspects of general relativity. You said we can actually test several aspects of general relativity, and therefore you know, really show that it still holds where we are looking at it, but what exactly are these effects? Well, okay, so uh, when, when, you, when you look at the theory, then uh, you can actually, so to speak, split the predictions by the theoretical side up into different orders mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, on the one hand, ever smaller effect, but also ever more subtle, okay? So we have not proven all of the effects of general relativity at this point. For instance, we have not yet been able to measure the spin of the black hole in the galactic okay. center. We've measured another property of general relativity, which is very important, and that's the so-called Schwarzschild precession. So, you know, t the two biggest effects in general relativity you would expect. One is the fact that when, when there's a star near the black hole and the star uh, sends photons to us, then these photons have to climb out of the gravitational potential. Mm -hmm. And so that means that, uh, you know, they get redshifted. Yeah. Another way of saying this, the clocks are going slower mm -hmm. there than here. Yeah. Okay. So that's the f first effect we saw right away in 2018, in fact, halfway through this Perry approach of the of the star, and we already had the effect. It's the, b the biggest effect you can see. Then two years later, we had the so-called Schwarzschild position. What is that? Well, if you have, in, in Newtonian terms, if you have a central mass, and then you have a, 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 a second object which orbits around this in a stable orbit, mm -hmm. in a plane, there's nothing else around. You have only these two objects, and this, this, this one dominates. Then this is a very simple two-body or central force a problem where the orbital shape here stays always the same in Newton. Mm -hmm. Always the same, so it doesn't change. Yeah. Not in general relativity. In general relativity, it, it changes uh, by processing in the plane of this orbit okay. in forward direction. And the, the change is the bigger, the closer in. Okay, And so that effect we've seen, and uh, the clarity with which we can see it uh, first of all, it is a confirmation of general relativity, uh, but also it tells you that there can't be anything else. This is what I said before. Mm -hmm. This thing is lonely, yeah. uh, this black hole. Suppose there, there's not just a single black hole, but two. Well, then that, that, that gives a very different pattern of, of this, this orbital uh, mm -hmm. change. So that we can see, and from that we can make estimates uh, about the environment of the black hole. For instance, many people have predicted that so-called dark matter might get sort of attracted by the black hole and sort of uh, you know, form a sort of a halo around it. And we could set now pretty strong limits uh, how, much, how much additional matter around the mm -hmm. big black hole, say in form of dark matter, uh, can be there. So that's astrophysically of importance. Yeah, yeah. As in, th in that sense, it does not about general relativity, but as a question mm -hmm. about the, so to speak, the object itself mm -hmm. uh, and, and how, how did it form and how does it interact with the uh, environment. The spin, um, if, if, the, if the black hole spin, there is a, obviously a direction. So if you now have a, a star which goes in, in a plane like this, it also starts to wobble around the, 
uh, uh, about the spin direction. And that's called the lens steering position. That lens steering position for the star we've seen is about 50 times smaller than the uh, position we've seen. Mm -hmm. So that one we have not yet uh, been able to see. Will you be able to see it? We hope uh, if there is a star which goes closer. So all these effects um, go like the the the, in the the smallest radius where the star goes relative to the event horizon, R over R Schwarzschild, to some power. Okay. So the higher order terms and the, the lens steering position, uh, there the power is three halves. Mm -hmm. And so, it, you know, the, the closer in it goes, uh, the stronger the effect is. So we are hoping by improving the sensitivity of our interferometric uh, machine by another factor of 100 currently, then we might see stars which go deeper into the, still deeper. Will they be there? We can't tell. Yeah. <laughs> it's just a question of hoping again that nature is good to us. Yeah. Uh, maybe not. What if that's not the case? Are there other ways to measure the spin? Yeah, there they are. I mean, we, I've, I've talked about the innermost region where we see this gas. Yeah. We might we might gather some information on the on the on the spin there, and likewise the radio astronomy measurement also mm -hmm. in principle depends also on the spin. It's not not very strong, so I'm not very hopeful. Yeah. Finally, gravitational waves. I mean that I would say is is a is a very likely contender, not in the galactic center necessarily, but in a nearby galaxy or even a distant galaxy. So if you have a big black hole. And then you have a, a you know a stellar black hole. Mm -hmm. Then the same happens as what LIGO had seen with two stellar black holes. The 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 stellar black hole, if it comes close enough, starts losing energy uh, by radiating gravitational waves, and then starts in spiraling. Um, and so then you can actually gather extremely important information about the, the innermost region around the event horizon, so to speak, in the last loop before the stellar black, mm -hmm. uh, black hole mm -hmm. falls in. Uh, that is something which, in principle, the LIGO experiment wanted and has done uh, from the in spiral of two stellar black holes. Yeah. But the problem is that it happens so fast. In the case of stellar black holes, this last, this last uh, uh, orbit, so to speak, take, t t takes only 0.1 seconds mm -hmm. or 100 milliseconds. Yeah. Not enough time to really measure the properties yeah. uh, very well. But if you have a big black hole, uh, uh, you know, one of our million or billion solar mass black holes and a stellar black hole, then these last turns take weeks. Okay. And so you have a long time to measure, you know, with high accuracy. Yeah. So that is an experiment which, however, has to be done in space. You can't do that on the mm -hmm. ground. So the European Space Agency and probably NASA together, we will see, um, planning an experiment, a very, very ambitious experiment of having three uh, satellites mm -hmm. two million kilometers away from each other, sending laser beams to each yeah. other. And this machine called LISA might then see one of these in-spirals okay. called extreme mass ratio in-spirals of a stellar black hole into a yeah. big black hole. Okay. And that, in a way, is the ultimate experiment, I would say. Yeah. So talking about other galaxies, um, so the event horizon has, the telescope has imaged this, the black hole at the center of our galaxy and the one at M87. Now, could you do observations that you did at the galactic center, similar ones also, for example, at M87? Yeah, if we could, if we could. Uh, the answer is we can't <laughs> because of the location of the telescopes in Chile. Ah, okay. Yeah. Okay. In fact, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. That would be a dream experiment. Uh, the nearest galaxy is the Andromeda galaxy. Mm -hmm. The ne nearest big galaxy yeah. is the and uh, big Andromeda, is Andromeda galaxy. Um, and that one has a black hole which is, let's see, 20 times more massive than the, than the galactic center. Mm -hmm. And uh, that one would be ideal to look at the motions of the stars there. Mm -hmm. It has been used in a spectroscopic sense. So the okay. spectroscopic experiment has uh, led to the determination of the central mass. But we would have the resolution to then see uh, individual stars. And then you could, so to speak, 
do parts of the Galactic Center experiment there, but Andromeda is in the Northern Hemisphere, and mm -hmm. so we cannot do that with with the VLT. And so, okay. um, but indeed, I, I think we 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 are using uh, dynamical motions to measure the masses of black holes. In fact, ten billion years ago, how do we do that? Well, we use the fact that. Um, active black holes, we call that active galactic nuclei, yeah. of which these quasars are, sort of to speak, the tip of the iceberg, um, get ever more common when you go back in time. And that is because in the early parts of the universe, when the galaxies were gro growing very rapidly, black holes were growing rapidly. So there were many more episodes of uh, strong accretion. And so then you have in almost every active galactic nucleus, an innermost ionized region, which empirically we know uh, must be moving at a velocity which is e equal to the, you know, the, the orbital orbital velocity. And so, if you can resolve that, then you can measure the masses of the black holes. You cannot test general relativity, but you can measure black. And we've we've done that now with with quasars. Uh, at a at a ratio of two and a half, so that's about eleven uh, giga years ago. So mm -hmm. only only about two and a half giga years after the Big Bang, and so yes, we can use the same techniques to make measurements of masses and and uh, uh, hopefully with increasing precision measure the uh, you know the, the the growth of of these black holes with these techniques. Yeah. Nice. Um, and the the telescopes Andrea Gates is using, they are in the northern hemisphere, right? Yeah, they are more or less in the northern hemisphere, and more or less because it's plus fifteen, plus seventeen degrees oh, okay. in latitude. Uh, um, but they could look, they could look at an Andromeda for sure. Okay. Um, but they don't have interferometry. No. Okay. okay. Yeah. So that's. Uh, uh, they they do have two telescopes, so there are two two ten meter telescopes in the Keck, uh, and in fact, in the in the distant past, there was a plan to add more telescopes, so one could perhaps do interferometry, but then it wasn't it wasn't realized at the time. Okay. Yeah. Well, it would be nice if they were also able to do interferometry. Then you could cover the. No, absolutely. Uh, it, and I have to say, I think, you know, um, it, if you're a radio astronomer and you want to big, build a bit bigger telescope, no radio astronomer would build a bigger single dish telescope. Yeah. It's very clear. Big, big and high resolution come together, and therefore you just build a bigger interferometer. That's mm -hmm. very clear. But for the reasons we discussed, that cannot or could not be done in the, in the optical or near infrared up to now, but now we can. Yeah. So I would, you know, I'm not a uh, prophet, but I, I would say could very well be that the success of the VLT-I, the interferometer of the VLT, will lead in the future to new projects, mm -hmm. which then uh, don't build a, a single big telescope, but instead, you know, do interferometry. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that sounds like yeah, sensible in a sense. Yeah. Um. Yeah, we have covered a lot, and we've seen that this is really a fascinating environment. Yeah. Like, no, I mean, I think it shows you, uh, yeah, the fascination of yeah. the universe and yeah. how much with modern techniques we can. Do in astronomy. I mean, it's not just in the, uh, the the black hole issue. There's also yeah. the exoplanet uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. story, the the cosmology yeah. story. Uh, in that sense, astronomy, as old as uh, science it is, uh, it, it is now one of the most fascinating parts of of physics. And uh, uh, the remarkable thing you see this in Nobel prizes. I mean, yeah. you know. It used to be the case that there were no Nobel Prizes in, in astronomy. Yeah. Um, perhaps also because um, the physics community would not accept, and there's also the will of, of Nobel and so forth, but that's not 
the case anymore. I mean, yeah. now it's it's really one of the more active areas yeah. of research. Yeah, and it's really just that in the 20th century, we started opening all the other wavelengths apart from the optical astronomy, right? Because optical astronomy, yes, people have been doing for hundreds of years, thousands of years, looking at the stars with their eyes, with telescopes, but only, yeah, since less than 100 years. We but look, let's be, other... let's be realistic, okay? And we, we, of course, we can ask ourselves a sort of a, an interesting, but a little more... A challenging question, mm -hmm. what will happen in the future? Yeah. yeah. Will that go on? Yeah. Will we build uh, eventually ever bigger telescopes? Well, in Chile, uh, ESO is now building a 40 meter telescope, yeah. yeah? The ELT. In fact, our institute uh, will, or is supposed to build the first instrument for it. Um, this is already 2 billion euros. Yeah. And the instrument, we are building is, in the end, if you uh, all told, about sixty million euros. Um, that is go that is already becoming difficult, if not in the future impossible, for science institutes, yeah. even Max Planck institutes. Yeah. Okay, we are in a European collaboration, so we are sharing yeah. uh, this around. But uh, it's it's very clear if you look to the U.S., for instance. Um, um, the normal university system already has stopped uh, in experimental astrophysics yeah. quite a while ago. Yeah. There are NASA institutions. They are, you know, very uh, rich, richly endowed private universities, which have been mm -hmm. able, Harvard, Caltech, and so forth. But even those are beginning to uh, have difficulties forming, uh, you know, it's a, it's a combination of the cost and the time over which, you know, it, it, this takes time, yeah. as we discussed. Yeah. And uh, it, donors may give you, I mean, the Keck, Keck, Mr. Keck was willing to give 200 million euros, uh, the dollars for, for the Keck telescopes. So that's, that's tremendous. Uh, but uh, you, it's harder for, to get a donor who gives you 10 million, 10 million euros a year for for 10 years, because yeah. it's uh, not as spectacular, right? Yeah. I mean, keck telescopes, you can say, oh, well, look up there. And yeah. So yeah. But the donors are not willing to give that for salaries and, and so forth. Yeah. So, that's, so as we look in the future, uh, we, we may have to worry at, at what level, uh, you know, the funding institutions will say, oh, it's beautiful stuff you're doing, but look. Uh, yeah. yeah. True. Now, of course, I, I, there, there is the issue of what is it good for, right? And um, the advantage we have, say, with black holes is it's really exciting to young people. Yeah. Believe me. I mean, I give so many talks <laughs> and it, it's far more exciting for young people to hear that story than some of the more, shall we say, relevant uh, issues uh, you might imagine mm -hmm. because it's it's a combination of uh, uh, yeah science fiction uh, uh, but then there's the weirdness of it all yeah. and 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 yet it's it's real science and so in a way we have the privilege and that helps us um, to get young people excited about uh, science yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's really the thing that just space, the universe, astrophysics, astronomy is really to a great part of the general public. It's just a fascinating topic. Yeah, that's nice. Okay, I think we've had a pretty great conversation. <laughs> Thank Very you nice. so much for, for joining this podcast. Okay, well, <laughs> I'm delighted that was interesting to you. Yes, definitely. That's it. Thank you so much for listening. This was the final episode of my Black Hole series. If you liked it and if you liked this podcast, please hit subscribe. I would love to hear your feedback on the series, so don't hesitate to contact us via Instagram, Twitter or LinkedIn or email.
Offspring Magazine, the podcast, is brought to you by the Max Planck PhD Net and the Science Communication Working Group known as the Offspring Magazine. The intro-outro music is composed by Srinath Rangkumar and the pre-intro jingle is composed by Gustavo Corizzo. For any feedback, comments or suggestions, please feel free to write us at offspring.podcast at phdnet.mpg.de. Until next week, stay safe, stay healthy. Bye-bye.